Hey guys, so we're gonna do a DIY today and I'm going to show you how to do a vertical swing garden like this one that I have here in the corner. And actually, I have this as a step-by-step -step in an old blog post of mine on homesteadbrooklyn.com. And even though we're not going to build one entirely because I have this one already built out, I'm gonna help show you the steps on how to achieve one for your place. And, uh, and this really appealed to me because I had this blank wall in the back, so it was just this kind of white wall. Actually, this heating unit wasn't even here at the time that this was developed, which I think was back in 2015. Yet, I didn't want to have something that was too all-encompassing, like my vertical garden in my bedroom because I still wanted to see some of the exposed brick. I thought that was a really charming aspect of this place. You know, it's like this old uh, steel mill that has been kind of repurposed into a residential unit, so I still wanted to see some of that white reflecting through. So this idea of the vertical swing garden seems to be super simple, but we have, you know, some there's some nuances and some things that could actually go really wrong if, uh, if you don't have the steps in place. So that's what I'm going to show you today. Let's see how it's actually built because it doesn't require too many things. You can see that we have some wood here uh, and you have these planters that just kind of fit in. Mind you, you'll notice that the, the planters don't have, um, they don't have uh, saucers on the base. So that's one thing I'll, I'll address. But you can see these holes are not like perfectly cut. They're hand cut holes. These were cut by my father. So I'll teach you how to do that. And the planters just kind of fit in right over here. And you'll see I have a second one and a third one. And essentially, you know, my ceilings are about, I would say roughly 10 to 11 feet high. I think they're 10 feet high ceilings. And um, you could make as many layers of these as you want, as many different levels. But, you know, if you put too many levels, it could look really crowded. And of course, depending on the size of the planter pots that you're using, and how tall your plants are going to grow, you may want to give them a little bit of room, which is you know, what I did here. Then you'll notice we have ropes. And with the ropes, you'll see we have something very simple, little zip ties. You can see I have three of them really here because just to reinforce the wood from you know, holding up, because this is the planter pots, it is a lot, of, a lot of weight. Then you'll notice I have up here this little stick and this You'll probably laugh at this, but this was an old broom handle that was just sitting here in the corner of my place for uh, quite a long time. And that's what I just used to repurpose it. And uh, all the wood that was used for this is actually repurposed old wood. Then if we go up even a little bit further, you'll see that there is a piece of wood up onto the ceiling because this house is all janky. I mean, nothing is in straight lines. So we needed something to reinforce. And you'll see that the ropes, which have these really cool ties, are up and hanging off of some hooks in order to be able to hang and dangle this. And so I recently had to remove this because this heating unit had to be put in and they kept on knocking into it. So I had to remove it. I removed all the plants. I kind of switched some of the plants around. Some of these plants have been in here since day one when I actually built it, and there's a number of ones that I've actually switched out. Um, and this is probably one of those things that is really doubles as decor in the house, so this is what I would consider a living piece of art, but uh, totally DIY. When you're doing DIY in your own home, it's just gonna be a little bit weird because there's not always a ton of space, and that is just something that I have to deal with here, living in Brooklyn. But I wanted to take you through some of the important things that you'll need in order to be able to complete this project. The, the first thing is actually finding a piece of wood. And like I had said, my, my dad actually had some wood that he had sitting in the basement. I really love to repurpose wood. These pieces of wood were actually left by the construction workers actually working on this building itself. So we ended up picking it up. And, um, and I'll point out a few things. When you're actually selecting wood or getting wood, especially if it's like, secondary recovery wood or something that um, is upcycled or recycled, you want to be actually mindful of the type of wood that you're getting. So if you look at this, you'll see that this wood is actually already cracking, which is going to be a stressor on this wood because you're going to have to put holes in the wood. And if you put holes in this wood could actually crack. So you want to check actually both sides of it. 
The other thing, if you actually have over here, you see another crack actually happening. And then you have these, like these knots, and you can see there's a, a crack happening in this knot. And this would, I would say, would not be a really good place to, to actually drill a hole because you have a crack here, a crack here, and not all these little inconsistencies. You want to make sure if it has knots that the knots are going to be contained within the hole itself. So if you move down this piece of wood, you'll see that this actually could work. So if you can imagine having a hole and you cut that out, just roughly speaking, then those knots are actually contained. This one right here as well, you'll see some knots. If you imagine cutting a hole in there, those knots are actually going to be contained within the hole, which is great. Now, this is just a solid piece of wood. Alternatively, if you want something that is a little bit more um, durable, then you're going to want these laminated layer pieces of wood, because wh what they're doing is actually taking thinner pieces of wood and they're kind of gluing them together and fitting them together. And this will give you a much more solid piece of wood. So when you're looking for that, that is some important things to keep in mind. I actually have this other piece of wood right here. So as you could see, uh, these knots, you know, this, this is a little knot right here, but this one looks like a more solid piece of wood. It doesn't have um, as many inconsistencies or, or cracks on it. So this would probably be the piece of wood that I would eventually work on if I had a choice. One of the other reasons to use maybe a piece of wood like this is that, you know, wood tends to warp over time depending on the humidity or the moisture in the room or if it had been sitting outside. You could see it'll start to, to warp. Even if you had wood from a different region and then you brought it into an, uh, a region here, it will start to warp. So what's beneficial about this is that it's, it's kind of like cross pattern. So it's going this way, the grain is going this way, and then the other grain is going this way in the opposite way. So even if one starts to warp, the one below it is going to warp the other way and it's going to, to maintain a, a durable structure. So this is another argument for actually using something like this. So let's talk about the other tools that you're going to need in order to make your vertical swing garden. The first is your handy dandy measuring tape because we're going to need to take a lot of measurements. Then you need a pencil because we're going to be making lines on this and circles in order to be able to cut the holes. Uh, rope and a nail or a screw is going to come in really handy and I'm going to tell you why afterwards. Then you'll need some very strong rope. I would recommend somewhere between 30 and 50 feet of rope. Zip ties, very good. Stud finder for finding studs in your ceiling. Then you're going to want a square. This is going to be for drawing straight lines. And this is a level, which is going to be very important, especially in my house, because nothing is level. So you don't want to just eyeball things. A handsaw, which I would recommend. I don't like working with like very high powered tools in a very small apartment setting. So this is going to come in handy when you have to cut things. Some drills, a little drill set. You want to get uh, drills that are not too fat because you're going to need to do drills in here in order to be able to fit the rope. And then you're going to have also a little wood drill that is going to fit into the wood perfectly but not break the wood. Some pretty durable hooks. I don't know how much weight these actually hold, but I could tell you that these are far thicker than the ones that I actually have in my vertical swing garden. So you'll probably want to talk to somebody at the hardware store in order to see how much weight these are going to hold. You're going to have your jigsaw and you're going to want to see the jigsaw blades. And if you, if you look on here, that this jigsaw blade is the one that actually makes round incisions or curved incisions. So you want something that's thin and flexible. Anything too thick is actually not going to be very good. It's not going to make a good cut for the what, what you want to do with this project. And then last but not least, you need the right size planter. So what is the right size planter? Well, that is going to be up to you. I've actually used something that is, I believe, just a little over six inches on the top. Here, yep, so six and a half inches on the top. And it's about four inches on the bottom. So you have to decide where you want your planter fitting. I like it somewhere in the middle. So the holes are going to be have to, have to be somewhere between five and six inches. 
And then from there, you're going to determine what your radius is going to be. And half of your uh, diameter is your radius. So the first thing that you want to do is actually measure the space because you don't want to make something so big that it doesn't fit. So if I had to measure this, this is uh, roughly about 45 inches across. So I essentially want to make my vertical swing garden a little bit smaller than that. So this one, you know, I have the benefit that this is already pre-made, but this one's 38 inches. Now I know my board is a little bit thicker and I'm not going to cut that board because it's, it's a really nice board. So this one is a, a little less than nine and a half inches. Um, it's about a nine and a quarter inches. And you can see that the, the holes here that were made, eh, they're roughly like five and two thirds, you know, and these are hand cut, so it doesn't have to be exact. But like I said, somewhere between five and six inches is going to be perfect. So you're looking at a radius that's between 2.5 inches and three inches. And you can see I have all different types of planter pots here, and I kind of like the look of that. It's a little bit more, uh, more shabby chic. Anyway, let's get over here because what I'd want to do first is, uh, well, let's switch out this board because this is the board that I said had a lot of inconsistencies and I'd rather not work with that if we have a board that's better. If we didn't have a board that's better, then you know what, then I could uh, can make do. But since I have the option, let's go with, with this one. All right, so what we're gonna wanna do is uh, measure out 38 inches. I like to, to make a few lines just to make sure it's as straight as possible. So then I'm gonna take my square Just do this, actually make this line up. I'm pretty anal about this. So there you go. So the best way to actually see where you're going to make the holes is just to really eyeball it. And I know it's not an exact science and you could actually take a measurements if you want, but I think you could take measurements really much after you eyeball it. And I think this looks pretty good. You know, it's, it's in from the center. You don't wanna make it too close to here for fear that it's going to just fall off. And, and I still think that three, given the fact that this is 38 inches, actually looks really good and roomy. So I'm just gonna like mark these marks right here for where I think it should be. And then we'll take exact measurements afterwards before we make any holes. So after we determined and eyeballed where we think we want the planters, we're going to actually find the exact center of this piece of wood. So you can see that it's just shy of about 11 and a half. So we're, we're looking at probably uh, five and a little over a quarter, I would say here. And I'm just gonna make a little cross right here so we know that that's actually going to be the middle. All right, and then after we find the center, we're gonna say, well, how big do we want the holes? Let's measure the radius. And the radius itself is going to be two and a half. I'm gonna determine that as two and a half. I'm gonna make a thicker pencil mark right there. And also two and a half on this side. One of the things that you could do after you measure the hole is if you have something that is that perfectly fits, then you could measure it and you could also make sure it's in the center by measuring these two edges right here to make sure it's perfectly in the center. And you could make a circle around that, which would be great. This, I would say, is just a little bit too big than what I would want. So I'm gonna put this away and I'm gonna show you this other technique, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's not perfect, but uh, if you're just making a little bit of a rough estimate, then this could actually work. So we have this measured out as the center and this is two and a half inches from the radius out and two and a half inches this way. So this is five inches total. And what you wanna do is, is take this down as to the lowest part as you could possibly get and really hold it tight between your fingers and then come this way about two and a half inches, and you're gonna wanna move your body around this in order to make a good circle. So 
you could take your time with it. So I'm just gonna run around this way, lightly do it just in case. And you wanna turn your fingers with this so the string doesn't wrap around the screw or the nail that you're using. I'm gonna have to go come around this way again. In order to finish the circle. Okay, so yeah, so you can see that's roughly the circle. Just finish it like this. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You can see that my dad did hand cutting of the holes. And so it's a little bit janky, but that's totally fine. Your planter's not going to, to fall in or between that. So this one will just fit. You could see that the bottom part of this will fall through, but it'll probably end up catching right here. And you know what, if you want to make it a little bit larger, you could also do that too. Okay, now that you have everything marked off, you're going to want to cut this wood. And again, I have this handsaw right here. This is going to be good because you're gonna have a little bit more control over it. It's gonna do a straighter line because if you're using something like this, like the jigsaw in the house, oftentimes that's kind of like all over the place. It's almost too much power than what you need. So this you'll be able to cut through and you'll get some bigger biceps along the way as well. Then next you're going to just measure your holes and you're gonna make sure that it's where you want them because once you start a hole and in this piece of wood, you don't wanna to have to scrap it. Now, I noticed that my hole was a little bit off. Okay, that's fine. I'm probably going to shift it before I cut it, but uh, this is where you're going to want to, to make the hole more or less. Now, that is where your jigsaw comes in. However, you're going to want to pick the right blade for this. So you could see, and also put it on the right setting. So if you come over here and you actually see, you know, th these you have like straight lines, this one is more of a curved line, so you're gonna to wanna to have this on that setting. It's kind of like the proper settings for when you're ironing your clothes. Like if you're gonna be ironing silk, you wanna make sure it's on silk. If it has cotton, then you wanna make sure it has on cotton. Then you're going to pick the right jigsaw blade and you're going to see it has the same type of no-nonsense graphic right there and then you're gonna to wanna to do the one that does the curve. And again, it's going to be thin and flexible because that is how you're going to get that curve. If it's gonna be something too thick and not flexible, then you're not going to be getting a good curve. So make sure that you pick the right one. Once you pick the blade, you're gonna to wanna to put that in, see where that fits, and if it locked. So you can't just take this and try to cut this hole out because there's no incision that, you, that you've made and you can't start from here and go in. So what you wanna do is then put this one away for now and then you take your drill and you're going to want to use this in order to be able to drill a hole, any, any place. I mean, I usually start in the middle, but uh, you're gonna to wanna to drill in here and that will make the incision in order to be able to then use your jigsaw blade. So once you have all the holes actually cut in this board, we're going to need to actually hang this up from the ceiling. But the only way to actually do that, I wouldn't say the only way, but one of the ways to actually do that is with using a rope. And the key to having this rope is drilling the same size hole as the rope. And the reason for that is because you're going to be using something as simple as zip ties underneath where the rope goes through so that it's thick and it doesn't go through the hole that you just created. So choosing the right drill bit is really important because you want the drill bit that is the same size as your rope. So if I'm eyeballing this drill bit right here, I'll show you what I'm seeing. And you could see that this rope is not really overshadowing this drill bit. The drill bit is too thick. So I'm gonna take a look at this drill bit and just eyeball that. And that actually looks really good because what I'm seeing from here, just, just one eye even, if you just take one eye, it's better than looking with two eyes because you see almost more perspective, is that you could see that this rope is just about the same size as this drill bit. 
So this is the one that I would be using. All right, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit more closer up here. You can see that this piece of wood was cut in order to be able to put these hooks in there. Because again, just to, to reiterate, you wanna find where the studs are. And the studs are the metal beams that uh, come out that basically hold the structure of this box that I'm in. And, uh, and you want to be able to drill these into the wood and the wood into the, the actual studs so that it could hold this weight. So you could see that this hook right here is much thicker than this. So this probably holds a little less weight than this. And again, I, I don't know how much weight this holds, but I would opt for, if you're not certain, to actually go with the, the larger one because you just don't want to have a situation on your hands where this, this whole thing falls out. The other thing that you want to do is to make sure it's far enough away from your wall because if it's too close, then it's not going to swing. You see this? It's just going to hit up against the wall, which could be fine if you don't have a lot of space. But for this, I have this roughly, oh, I would say about 11 and a half to 12 inches away from the actual wall itself. Now, one of the things I actually don't have that I have an extra one to show you is this, this right here. And, um, and you could just get, like I said, a broom handle. You could, get, you could buy uh, wooden railings at like a Home Depot or any of your hardware stores and just use that as well. Since you're up here, you're going to see how we've drilled holes here in the wood and how you have these zip ties below. And you can see some of these zip ties eventually started to, to fall down. So you're gonna see the zip ties right here. And while you're still there, I'm going to show you where the level comes into place, since we're not going to be building one of these again. You're gonna put this right here to make sure that it's level, so that when you're setting this in, you're gonna be putting the zip ties in the appropriate place. And this is not going to be like this, lopsided. So one of the reasons why we actually have the broomstick and the, the reason why it's actually helpful is because this is already pretty wobbly because you're hanging out with a, with a bunch of ropes. You wanna have some stability. And you'll see that this kind of takes a, a V, it V's off and it actually gives it a little bit of stability because it eventually needs to be one rope and breaks off into two. And if you started from two in the beginning, the center of gravity would, would be off. So it's important to be able to find a knot. Um, I have to get the name of the knot. I think it's called a slip eight knot uh, that, that will work here, here, and would then branch off. And it's gonna take a little bit of trial and error, which is why I recommend getting 30 to 50 feet of rope in order to do this project. So one of the things I wanna show about this whole planter is You'll notice that they have saucerless bottoms. So that means when you water the plant, that the water will often, if you water it uh, thoroughly enough, it'll fall down into the planter below. So one of the things I would recommend that if the water is splashing into the plant below and you overwater these ones on the bottom, then you might wanna actually have some temporary saucers on the floor in order to be able to take up some of that water. Um, it's not a perfect thing, and I have tried to find planters with little saucers that could click in. They do exist out there, but they're not necessarily as pretty as some of these terracottas, so you have to, to weigh the costs and benefits of that. And just to go over the types of plants that I actually have in here, um, this is a tenanthi. It's looking a little sad, but I've had this tenanthi in here since 2015. And then this is my Syngonium potophyllum variegatum. This one's a relatively new one that I put in about a year ago. This is my Hoya densifolia, and this was actually back in my bedroom under a grow light, and it was just growing so wildly. And I said, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll put it in here, and you could see a lot of new growth. This has just been growing every single season that I've had it here. This one is my Ardizia, and you could see some of its other, otherwise called coral berry. And I actually just picked this one up um, some of the berries are falling off right now, but uh, I actually just picked this one up during Christmas time, so it's only a couple months old. You could see that it's in this kind of peaty mixture, which was its original pot, potting mixture, and it needs a little bit of water. So um, I think what I'm going to do is probably change it out of the pot because it needs a, 
a better mixture in order to take the water because the water tends to just run right through. This is, I think this is called Japortia latifolia now. Um, it used to be Calathea lancifolia, and I've had this one since, you know, the beginning part of time. So it's looking a little bedraggled, but it's also four years old. This is my uh, Marsdenia floribunda. It used to be called the uh, Stephanotis floribunda, and this will probably never flower again, but um, this has been growing in this, uh, in this area for, for now almost five years as well. A relatively new one, this is about a couple of years old that I've had, Ph Philodendron Wendy Imbi, and I really like it. It looks like this kind of punky foliage. It's growing all these little tiny leaves off of it. This is my uh, Maranta Lucanora variegata, and this has been growing in here for probably three or four years. And then this is my Drymonia, and this had been growing in my bathroom, and it got a little bit too long. Then a house mouse came and started nibbling on it when I moved it onto my kitchen counter. And I got my house mouse problem in control, and now I've, I've put it here because for a lack of other space, and, uh, and I think it looks pretty good. So I hope that gives you a little bit more inspiration on the vertical swing garden. And I know even though we didn't build one today, that this, between this and the, the blog post, it gives you enough kind of knowledge in order to be able to grip on how to actually build one for yourself in your home. And of course, if you have other DIY suggestions for plants, then tell me your suggestions in the comments below. All right, guys, see you later. I hope the Vertical Swing Garden provides some inspiration for affordable DIY in your home. If you have any more ideas that you'd like to see, then feel free to share them in the comments below. And if you're enjoying these videos, then I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel as it helps others find videos like this. Additionally, we have other ways to support the channel consider becoming a sustaining member. It's through your generosity that really helps content like this get made. Or check out our merchandise featuring the Forever Kippy collection. For every 100 items sold, we donate $100 to the Wild Bird Fund, which is the only rehabilitation center in New York City for injured and abandoned birds. More information on homesteadbrooklyn.com.